Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is January 29, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 71. On the afternoon of Wednesday, January 13, there was a rare blizzard here in Washington, D.C. Government offices and businesses closed up early to allow workers to head home. As commuters fought their way through the worsening snowstorm, the nation's capital turned into one giant traffic jam. The worst jams of all were on the bridges that led across the Potomac River to the nearby suburbs in Virginia. Motorists inched across the snow-swept bridges in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Only a few hundred feet above the jam-packed bridges Jet airliners were climbing into the swirling snowstorm. The planes were taking off from National Airport, nestled next to the river just south of the heart of Washington. Following required procedures, the jets were twisting and turning to stay over the Potomac River as they climbed. Suddenly drivers on the twin 14th Street bridges, closest of all to the airport, looked up in horror. A blue, green, and white jetliner came screaming down out of the blizzard. There was a deafening roar, a smashing of metal that shook the bridge, a giant splash that shattered the smooth ice on the Potomac. Then for a shocked moment, silence. Then pandemonium as people poured out of their stalled cars. On the bridge there was a grisly scene of wrecked cars. A fifty-foot span of the bridge railing was gone, and in the river below the shattered remains of the jetliner were fast sinking out of sight. Soon special news bulletins were flashing across the country. An Air Florida Boeing 737 Flight 90 to Tampa, Florida had crashed on takeoff from Washington's National Airport. In the immediate aftermath of the tragedy, News reports focused on the heart-rending human interest aspects of the crash. Time after time we have seen television scenes of the makeshift rescue efforts. Few will soon forget those numbing scenes of a precious few survivors being fished out of the icy Potomac River. Millions were inspired by the heroism of a bystander who risked his own life by swimming out to rescue a drowning woman. And my friends, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself will reward the greatest hero of all that day. He was the crash survivor who time after time passed the rescue ring to others and then perished himself. He was the man to whom the entity President Reagan referred the following day in a New York City speech. Speaking as he was in the true Bolshevik Zionist capital of the United States, our alleged President misquoted our Lord Jesus Christ in the words, Greater glory has no man." Unquote. Surely the man who gave his life that others might live deserves a better epitaph than a politician's preoccupation with glory. What our Lord Jesus Christ really said was, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. That is what our Lord Himself did nearly two thousand years ago, and that is what the man in the water did after the crash of the Air Florida Flight 90. My friends, the very human tragedy of the crash of Flight 90 is important all by itself, but if we are to have any hope of avoiding even greater tragedies that are looming ahead, we must look beyond the human interest stories. We need the answers to some important questions such as, why was there a plane crash at all that day? Why that plane? And what made it crash? We are being led to believe that we are being given answers to those questions. But the true answers, my friends, are far different from what you have heard up to now. The crash of Air Florida Flight 90 was a terrible tragedy, but it was also more than that. It was also intended as a warning to certain powerful circles here in the United States, and as such it was not an isolated incident, but part of a much larger pattern now taking shape. For some five years now a secret war has been underway between the present rulers of Russia and those of the United States. The secret war has waxed and waned, and now it's heating up once again. 
In the ongoing secret war it is now Russia that is taking the offensive. Having put out the fuse on the Poland time bomb, at least for the moment, the Kremlin is now counterattacking against their Bolshevik enemies here. Russia's secret new rulers are trying to send a message to the Bolsheviks who have seized power here in America. The message is, War does not pay. The Russians are delivering this warning message in many ways which are totally unsuspected by most of the public. My friends, the Russians are once again unleashing geophysical warfare against the United States and against some of our allies. One aspect of this geophysical onslaught is weather warfare. The crash of Air Florida Flight 90 was brought about in the midst of largely man-made severe weather. The Russians are also firing warning shots across America's bow by means of another geophysical warfare weapon, artificial earthquakes. The Russians are also readying themselves for attack on another front, the economy of America and the West. This month, January 1982, the Kremlin has scored a stunning economic coup. Before the year is out, the entire economy of the United States will be vulnerable to a total collapse at Russia's hands. In this AUDIO LETTER I want to give you the details about the new Russian offensive now underway. Also, I plan to resume reporting each month by means of the AUDIO LETTER tape series. Based on the response of my comments in AUDIO LETTER No. 70 last month, I believe this is the best way I can serve you after all at this time. I will say more about that in my last minute summary. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1. The Siberian Express and Renewed Russian Geophysical Warfare. Topic No. 2. Russia's Secret Economic Coup in Dollar Assets and Topic No. 3, The Shifting Alliances for Nuclear War I. Topic No. 1. In his famous Liberty or Death speech of March 1775, Patrick Henry said some words that have taken on new meaning in our modern age. He said, quote, Gentlemen may cry, Peace, Peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms." Unquote. Today voices in Washington talk of keeping the peace, but today even more than in Patrick Henry's day the cries of peace are a sham. A secret war is underway, and this month unprecedented gales have swept in from the north as part of that secret war. For the United States as a whole, January 1982 has been the most severe in history. Records for low temperatures have been broken by wide margins in countless places from the Canadian border to Florida. There has been blizzard piled on blizzard to paralyze even the northern states who are accustomed to snow, and in vast areas of the southern United States there have been historically unprecedented blasts of sub-zero Arctic air. Snowstorms, sleet storms, freezing rain, bitter cold. That has been the story for the eastern two-thirds of the United States this January. Meanwhile, the West Coast has primarily faced a different problem, spells of incredible rainstorms causing giant mudslides and many deaths, and caught in between. The Rocky Mountain States have had their own unique problems. There have been violent windstorms with winds in some areas more powerful than most hurricanes. Only a few days ago winds reached an awesome 140 miles per hour in northern Colorado. The National Weather Service of the United States has come up with a popular nickname for the repeated invasions of Arctic air this winter. They are calling it the Siberian Express, quote unquote, and with good reason. Northern Siberia in the Soviet Union is one of the coldest regions on the face of the earth. That is exactly where the supercooled air has been coming from to spill all across North America, and my friends, it has been directed here by weather modification techniques. 
Russia's basic weapons for massive weather modification are still as I reported nearly two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 54. The Russians used two legs of their secret space triad of manned strategic weapons. One leg is their fleet of Cosmospheres, which levitate in the Earth's electromagnetic field. Using their beam weapons, they are able to guide storm systems by altering the electrical charges in the upper atmosphere. And to set off certain types of storms, the Russians use another leg of their secret space triad, that is, their complex of moon bases. The enormously powerful particle beam weapons on the moon can be fired into the ocean to set off storms. Squadrons of Cosmospheres then take advantage of natural weather forces to build up and guide these artificial storms. I describe the process in detail in AUDIO LETTER No. 54, so we will not repeat it again now. As I revealed at that time, the Russians began using these new weather war techniques against the United States that month, February 1980. The Kremlin was counterattacking against the Carter Administration grain embargo against Russia. The Bolsheviks here were trying to use their old favorite weapon, hunger, against the Russia they used to control. Russia's new rulers responded with weather control designed to reduce our crops, and in February 1980 that took the form of incredible rainstorms lashing agricultural areas of Southern California and Arizona. The Carter Administration grain embargo continued through the summer of 1980, and so did Russian weather modification. Much to the surprise of long-range weather forecasters here, the summer of 1980 set records for drought and blistering heat. Crops died for lack of rain and excessive heat. Thousands of cattle died for the same reasons. In the southwest, millions of chickens fried on their feet under the blistering heat wave. Water shortages started multiplying nationwide. And to drive the point home to our then peanut farmer president, the peanut crop failed, something previously unheard of. The Bolsheviks here still continued the grain embargo through the end of 1980. There was about to be a change of administration, and the new administration was expected to end the embargo. But just to make sure, the Russians kept up the pressure. In January 1981, just one year ago, a strange cold wave hit the United States. As the late Washington Star reported on January 13, 1981, quote, Siberian cold spread a record freeze across the southeast today, dipping deep into Florida where citrus and vegetable growers fought to save their crops against the worst winter onslaught of the century." Unquote. That day it was announced that 25 per cent of Florida citrus crops had been killed by the freeze. The freeze had also killed up to half of America's supply of certain vegetables. If that news report of a year ago has a familiar ring to it, my friends, it certainly ought to. The strange river of Arctic air that froze America's east coast and damaged Florida's crops one year ago this month was a product of Russian weather modification. It was a limited taste of what could be done. It was a warning to America's rulers that they were courting disaster with their campaign of hunger against Russia. Three months later the grain embargo against Russia was lifted. In response, Russian weather war against America was terminated, and last summer, the summer of 1981, returned to normal in terms of weather. That is how it stood until mid-December. Then came martial law in Poland. And by then the American Bolsheviks, who did not initially control the so-called Reagan Administration, had regained power here in Washington. Right away the entity President Reagan started talking about sanctions against Russia, just as his predecessor had done over Afghanistan. And once again the new Administration started saying that a new grain embargo should be considered against Russia. This time, said the President, 
steps should be taken to make the embargo airtight. That was enough for Russia's new rulers. They know about the efforts by the reagan begin Axis to bring on war, and they are convinced that the time to talk is growing very short. They are convinced that war is inevitable between Russia and Russia's recently expelled masters, the Bolsheviks, who are now here in America. So in late December the Politburo agreed that the time had come to take the offensive against the United States. The Russian weather offensive began with a rainstorm attack against the West Coast. Using the techniques I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 54, Cosmospheres were deployed partly offshore and partly inland. Those offshore, deployed in quadrangles of four Cosmospheres each, used defocus electron beams to set up negatively charged vapor clouds. Inland some distance from the coast, duos of two Cosmospheres each loaded the atmosphere with positively charged protons from defocused beam weapons. This resulted in the movement of vast quantities of water to target areas for release as rain. The rainstorm attack formation was set up to bring varying amounts of rainfall to most of the West Coast, especially California, but the area chosen as a primary target was a 200-mile stretch centered on San Francisco. The reason for selecting San Francisco is very simple. Russia's new ruling group regard the United States as degenerate, and the most degenerate of all West Coast cities in their view is San Francisco. For several days beginning on January 5, the region around San Francisco was drenched by unrelenting torrents of rain. It continued until San Francisco was isolated, cut off by flood waters and in the Santa Cruz area south of San Francisco half a mountainside collapsed, carrying with it houses, cars, and more than 20 victims. By the weekend the rainstorm attack was tapering off. The next weather attack was brewing in the form of a vast wave of Arctic air. The first Siberian Express was on the way. The technique used for the Siberian Express is a new variation on the Cosmosphere techniques of AUDIO LETTER No. 54. The Russians have now learned how to take a huge air mass from one place in the world and transport it to another area of the planet. First, the Russians deployed a large number of Cosmospheres, 17 squadrons in all, over northeastern Siberia. The area covered ranged from about 105 to 170 degrees east longitude and latitudes from 65 degrees northward to the Arctic Ocean. These Cosmospheres used the focus electron beams over a period of days to give a strong negative charge to the whole frigid air mass. The Siberian air temperature ranged from 60 to 70 degrees below zero. Next, a series of Cosmosphere squadrons were deployed at intervals of roughly 1,000 miles across the North Pacific toward America. These Cosmosphere squadrons, like beads on a necklace, followed a line from a point north of Japan to the vicinity of Eureka, Northern California. The Cosmospheres in this Trans-Pacific line formed the tracks for the Siberian Express air mass to follow. Hovering at the fringes of space, they pumped out vast quantities of positive protons to attract the Siberian air mass toward America. The negatively charged Siberian air was attracted eastward and also higher than normal, where it moved relatively unaffected by lower atmosphere weather patterns. On weather maps the Siberian air masses are drawn as if they are flowing down horizontally from Canada, but the Siberian air actually arrives by a different route. It is pulled in over northwestern North America above the other weather. Then from the Continental Divide eastward, Cosmospheres pull it down to flood the land with super-cold air. In other words, it spills all over North America primarily from above, not by the normal horizontal path. The Siberian air reaches here so fast by this man-made route 
that it does not warm up as much as it would otherwise. The result? Bone-chilling weather that has many weathermen scratching their heads, and as a by-product of this technique violent windstorms are created around the edges of the downward-spilling Siberian air. These are especially intense along the Rocky Mountains. The first Siberian Express cold wave was timed carefully. Earlier I mentioned the January 13, 1981 reports of a freeze that destroyed part of Florida's crops. This year the news on January 13, one year later to the day, a killer freeze had once again just hit Florida, only this time it was far worse. Last January damage amounted to some $230 million, but this time as much as 84 per cent of the Florida citrus and vegetable crops froze for losses of over a billion dollars. The news of Florida's staggering crop losses came on Wednesday, January 13. That same afternoon an Air Florida Boeing 737 tried to take off from National Airport here in Washington. It was the ill-fated Flight 90 bound for Tampa, Florida. Flight 90 and many others were delayed that afternoon because of the snowstorm. The main runway, which runs north and south, was closed for over an hour while the snow was cleaned off. Meanwhile Flight 90 and other planes boarded their passengers and waited at the terminal. As they waited, ground crews sprayed a kind of antifreeze solution on the planes. A surviving passenger of Flight 90, himself a pilot, was quoted two days later in the Washington Post in the words, they were de-icing the aircraft continuously." Unquote. Finally word came from the control tower that the runway was ready. Jetliners started pulling away from the terminal, lining up to taxi out to the runway. It was still snowing, but reportedly it was a cold, dry snow, much less likely to cause icing than sleet or freezing rain. Later one of the pilots of another plane said he thought he had seen ice on the Air Florida jet. Other pilots, though, said they had seen no ice at all on it. As Flight 90 waited its turn, 18 other airplanes took off without any apparent difficulty. One was a 737 like the Air Florida jet belonging to another airline. Unlike Flight 90, it was carrying a full load of passengers. It took off without incident, but the Air Florida jet was destined to be less fortunate. Unknown to the other passengers, there were five important military personnel aboard. They were members of a special Laser Warfare Task Force assigned to the home of the so-called Rapid Deployment Force in Florida. That is the military force, my friends, which is undergoing highly secret preparations for the coming Middle East War. Having engaged in meetings at the Pentagon, the men were returning to their home base in Florida. At last the Air Florida 737 took its position at the end of the runway. As it did so, it was being tracked by a Russian Cosmosphere hovering high above the airport in the midst of storm clouds. It was armed with a neutron beam weapon. At 3.59 p.m. the jet started its takeoff roll down the runway. The Cosmosphere waited until the jet was about halfway down the runway and moving over a hundred miles per hour. Then the invisible neutron beam was fired down through the snow at the cockpit of the jet liner. In AUDIO LETTER No. 64 I describe the effects which are produced by an intense blast of neutron radiation. It disrupts all electrical activity. That includes the electrical activity of the human body, including the brain, the eyes, the nervous system, and the heart. When the beam was fired at the Air Florida jet, it was expected that the pilot and co-pilot would be instantly rendered unconscious or killed. That would have left the jet still accelerating, perhaps drifting off the runway and finally leaving the boundaries of the small airport to plunge into the river. It would have been a very strange crash, and one very hard for government officials here to explain away to the public. But the Russians miscalculated. 
individuals vary considerably in their resistance to neutron radiation effects, and apparently someone in the cockpit retained some shred of consciousness. I cannot tell you what went on in the cockpit, but I can tell you what the plane did. The jet continued down the runway instead of drifting off. There was also an effort to apply the brakes, yet the engines kept going full blast. The plane started shuddering, but the brakes could not prevent the plane from continuing to accelerate slowly. The plane reached full takeoff speed as it ran out of runway and rotated upward into a climb. At that point it's believed that whoever was at the controls may have finally blacked out. The plane was pointing upward far too steeply and started mushing through the air instead of climbing normally. No pilot or co-pilot would have let that continue, and yet it was never corrected. Equally startling, the landing gear was never pulled up. Normally the gear is lifted immediately after takeoff to help streamline the plane. That would be even more urgent if a pilot were having troubles with ice as has been alleged, or if a crash landing were imminent. But when the Air Florida jet dropped out of the snowy sky that afternoon, it was still nose up and gear down, and from brake release to impact there was never a mayday call from Flight 90. Five days later a Russian Cosmosphere triggered another spectacular plane crash to continue driving home the warning to our leaders. The pride of the Air Force, the aerial demonstration team called the Thunderbirds, were practicing near Indian Springs Air Force Base, Nevada. They were practicing a maneuver known as Line Abreast Loop in which the four T-38 jets swoop down in a steep dive and then pull up close to the ground. It is not considered the most difficult of the Thunderbirds maneuvers, but it does call for close coordination. The leader concentrates on getting the loop just right. The other three concentrate on following the leader precisely. That afternoon over the Nevada desert a Cosmosphere was waiting. As the four jets screamed earthward, the Cosmosphere waited until they neared the ground. Then a neutron beam was fired at the cockpit of the lead plane, incapacitating the pilot. The lead plane plowed into the desert, and the other three following the leader did the same. Meanwhile by that time the nation was in the grip of the Second Siberian Express Super Cold Wave. And my friends, Russia's geophysical warfare campaign includes other things besides the weather. In AUDIO LETTER No. 59, 15 months ago I reported that Russian earthquake-generating cobalt bombs had been planted in the Northeast. They are concentrated most heavily around New York City but as I reported then also extend northeast into New England. Since that time additional earthquake generators have been planted, and this month they have been used twice. On the morning of January 9 an earthquake measured at 5.9 on the Richter scale was set off in eastern Canada near Maine. It was the worst New England earthquake in 127 years. Nine days later a second earthquake was set off this time in New Hampshire. If there should be another earthquake soon in the northeast, don't be surprised if it is even closer to New York City. The Russians are on the offensive, and our war-crazy rulers are refusing to heed these warnings. Topic No. 2. This year of 1982 has started out with bad news on the economic front. Inflation is said to have slackened off slightly, but as every householder knows, it has not gone away by any means. Only a short decade ago President Nixon declared a national emergency when official inflation rates reached only 7 to 8 percent. If anyone had told you then that 10 percent inflation was on the way, you probably would not have believed it, yet today we are supposed to be relieved when inflation drops to that level. As bad as inflation is, another worry is pushing it into the background in the minds of millions of Americans. The number one worry now is that of losing one's job, and no wonder. Early this month 
it was announced that unemployment as officially calculated reached 8.9 per cent in December. Among blue-collar workers who actually produce the nation's goods, it is even worse. More than one out of eight is out of work. Unemployment is worst of all in the auto industry. Officially, nearly 22 per cent of all auto workers ended December without a job. The auto industry, my friends, is not just in a recession, it's in a depression. The same is true of housing and construction. And as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 69, these two sectors are the keys to throwing America's entire economy into a depression. We are descending deeper and deeper into the mire of economic stagflation, that is, high inflation with high unemployment. There's nothing accidental about it, my friends. It's being orchestrated by powerful forces who are bent on seizing more power, and the plans were laid long ago. That's why I was able to give details in advance about our present woes eight years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. For example, American business today is being strangled by a credit crunch, the so-called tight money policy of the privately owned Federal Reserve Corporation. The tight money and high interest rates, we are told, are the bitter medicine we must take in order to cure inflation. As a result, small and medium-sized industries which welcomed inflation just a few short years ago are now in distress because of it. The situation now is the one I tried to warn against eight years ago. On page 83 of my book I expressed it this way, and I quote, In the early stages of stagflation those industries in debt are able to pay off their indebtedness with cheap dollars. But in the later stages these same industries are apt to experience a scarcity of capital." Unquote. The White House and Capitol Hill are well aware that millions of us are hurting badly from the worsening economic conditions, and so to make political hay they are all pointing fingers at one another and proclaiming themselves to be our champions. Meanwhile, what have they done concretely to deal with the situation? Why, of course, they are helping themselves. Only a few days ago the Internal Revenue Service announced a tremendous new windfall tax break for members of Congress. The new rules, which were ordered by Congress, virtually exempt Congressmen and Senators from paying any Federal income tax. While the rest of us struggle to make ends meet, Congress has once again made sure that its members do not share our plight. Workers who have given up big chunks of their pay lately in order to save their companies must still pay up to Uncle Sam, but not your Senator or Congressman. I suggest you remember that the next time you see any member of Congress crying crocodile tears about your economic woes. And what about the Federal Reserve Board, which is responsible for setting the high interest rates that are choking our economy. Might the nation's private central banking system relent a bit in view of the frightening upsurge in unemployment? Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker answered that earlier this week in a speech in Las Vegas. Speaking to a convention of home builders, Volcker said in effect that the interest rate crunch is doing what it is supposed to do. Therefore, said Volcker, the Federal Reserve has no intention of lowering interest rates and loosening up money. But then why should anyone expect anything else from Paul Volcker? As I detailed in my book eight years ago, Volcker was one of the prime architects of the long-range plan to ruin the dollar, and I revealed more about Volcker's role about the coming depression and war in my very first talking tape in 1974. In that tape I mentioned Volcker's role as one of the prime conspirators who helped spirit away America's gold. On all sides, my friends, there is corruption, double dealing, lies, conflicts of interest, and criminality in high places. Last month I reported that a new phase of the gold scandal is underway. It involves the movement of gold from the New York Assay Office 
to the insecure West Point Depository. The so-called Reagan Administration is preparing to close down the New York Assay Office and is giving excuses for it that make no sense whatsoever. One such excuse is to improve security, but the security at West Point is even worse than that of the New York Assay Office. Another excuse for moving the gold is said to be to save money, but hundreds of thousands of dollars are being squandered at West Point because of the gold transfer. The only real result of the gold transfer will be to make it easier to steal. As I reported last month, one of the principals involved in implementing the plan to shut down the essay office was Dr. Alan Goldman. Goldman has been with the Bureau of the Mint since 1970 and has been its Deputy Director for some time. The Director, Donna Pope, is a political appointee with little more than figurehead status. Therefore, it's Goldman who has really been running the Bureau of the Mint, that is, until a few weeks ago. There has been a very odd new development. Having helped to set the events in motion for a shutdown of the New York Assay Office, Goldman resigned from his top job at the Mint on December 22. Reportedly he has accepted a position in private industry. So what's odd about that? Just this. The New York Assay Office is the only government-owned facility for refining precious metals in the country. After it is shut down, the Reagan Administration plan is to contract out the refining of gold and other precious metals to a private industrial concern. It will be a bonanza for whoever receives the government refining contract, and Dr. Goldman, who just left the Mint for private industry, just happens to be an expert in precious metals refining. The strange circumstances surrounding the plan to close down the New York Assay Office are raising many questions, and those questions multiply in light of major concerns over the shutdown plan from another source. That source, my friends, is the United States Navy. Up to now the Assay Office has played a critical role in the Navy's Silver Reclamation Program. The Navy has an ongoing requirement for silver reclamation from many tons of materials each year. These materials include worn-out batteries, photographic supplies, and many components of classified systems. The Navy sends these things to the Assay Office in New York, which extracts the silver and returns it to the Navy. In addition, the Silver Reclamation Program of the Navy generates large amounts of precious metals by-products. These by-products include not only gold but rare metals like platinum and iridium, which are much more valuable than gold. The New York Assay Office does not return these precious metals by-products to the Navy. Instead, they are returned to the Government's strategic stockpile of critical materials or to the Treasury. Either way, these precious by-products remain in Government hands. The plan to close down the Assay Office has the Navy up in arms. Transferring the Silver Reclamation Program into the hands of private industry will mean that the Government will lose control of those precious metals by-products. The Navy is convinced that the refining contractor will be in a position to pocket large amounts of the by-products. It will be a tremendous windfall profit for the refining contractor and could even compromise national security. The so-called Reagan Administration claims to consider national security its top priority, yet proposes to damage it by the New York Assay Office shutdown. Yes, a precious metals by-products profit windfall awaits the private refining contractor. And my friends, Dr. Alan Goldman, who has just joined private industry, was the United States Mint's top specialist in the area of extracting precious metals by-products. Besides the Goldman affair, other developments are raising still more questions about the sudden movement of gold to the isolated West Point Depository. 
One of these developments is the change which is taking place in the recommendation expected soon from the United States Gold Commission. In AUDIO LETTER No. 67 I detailed the plan which then existed for the Gold Commission to propose a new pseudo-gold standard for America, but in recent weeks that plan has been changed. Instead, the Administration wants the Commission to recommend only that a new gold coin be minted for its psychological value. The earlier pseudo-gold standard plan would have required that some gold be on hand, but now the United States Government suddenly needs to be free to sell gold secretly through intermediaries on the free market. The reason is a stunning economic coup by Russia. United States intelligence operatives first picked up hints that something big was in the works early last fall. As the information developed, the decision was made to move the New York Assay Office gold to West Point, and earlier this month on January 11 the dreaded Russian economic coup began to take place. What took place that day was a secret financial transaction in Geneva, Switzerland, the first of many which cannot be reversed. A deal was struck which will progressively give the Russian Government a decisive economic edge over the United States. It will give the Soviet Union devastating leverage over the United States Treasury Department in particular and thus over the economic fate of this country in general. When the series of transactions which began this month have been completed, it will give the Kremlin effective control over America's economic structure. The Russians will be in a position to use this unique power in any way they choose. They can use it to disrupt the economic maneuvers of the great and powerful forces here if desired. They can also use it to destroy the investments and assets of every person having a bank account or fund denominated in dollars or they can threaten America's rulers with economic blackmail if America's secret war preparations are not stopped. Once the transactions now underway are completed, those capabilities will be in Russia's hands. The transaction of January 11 was a huge gold sale by Russia to certain other interests. First, Russia had placed billions of dollars worth of gold in escrow under control of three Geneva banks. Then the buyers of the gold paid for it in billions of dollars worth of United States Treasury securities. That is, title to these Treasury instruments of liability was transferred to the Soviet Union. The sale is to be only the first of many because the gold buyers control vast quantities of Treasury securities, that is, billions of dollars' worth of Treasury bills, notes, and bonds. These securities bear interest and mature at specified dates. At the maturity date the holder has the right to turn them in and receive full payment of the principal from the Treasury Department, but usually that does not happen. Most big holders of Treasury securities roll them over at the maturity date. That is, the holder exchanges the old note or bond for a new one and continues collecting interest. But now billions upon billions of dollars' worth of these United States Treasury securities are beginning to move into the hands of the Russian Government, and once they hold a large enough hoard of these Treasury instruments, the Russians can choose not to roll them over. They can present them to the Treasury Department and say, Pay up! Intelligence circles here in the United States were notified immediately after consummation of the first deal on January 11. In response, certain Government officials here are trying to undo the agreement by attempting to reduce the market price of gold. To that end, gold from what little is left of America's decimated stockpile is being secretly sold on the open market through devious channels, but so far this tactic has had little effect on the gold markets. In any case, my friends, the agreement has been struck between Russia and certain Persian Gulf Arabs, 
and both parties have already resolved that they will follow through even if the market price of gold drops to zero, because this financial transaction is a rare one in the history of the world. It is based primarily on moral grounds. Both parties believe that the United States has become hopelessly degenerate. In their eyes America is Babylon, and until Babylon falls the world will never know peace. As I say these words, the clammy atmosphere of panicky fear is taking hold in certain financial circles here. The sum total of all outstanding Treasury obligations, that is, the national debt, now stands at $1 trillion. The Soviet Union has now begun acquiring control of a portion of that debt. Top Treasury officials are beginning to see the specter of calamity looming ahead. Someday Russia may, in effect, walk into the United States Treasury as if it were a bank and withdraw her deposits. The strain thus produced could induce other large holders of Treasury securities to do the same out of fear of weakness in the Treasury's position. It could all snowball into the great granddaddy of all bank runs, an international run on the Treasury of the United States. The Treasury could not possibly pay off the trillion-dollar national debt and so the Treasury would collapse, and with it would go the entire economy of the United States, and finally of the entire Western world. Topic No. 3 Three days ago on January 26, the entity President Reagan gave his first State of the Union speech. That same day an all-day meeting took place in Geneva, Switzerland between the two top diplomats of America and Russia, Secretary of State Alexander Haig and Russia's Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko met far longer than expected that day, nearly eight hours in all. The reasons given publicly for the meeting were intentionally vague. Supposedly there was no particular agenda for the meeting, nothing specific to negotiate, no clear-cut goals to be accomplished. In fact, the main comments the two sides made to reporters beforehand were about what they intended not to discuss. Haig said he would not talk about any resumption of the SALT talks. Gromyko said he would not talk about Poland, and at the end of the day even the single announced outcome of the discussions was negative. We were told that any effort to set up an East-West summit between Reagan and Brezhnev was being put on a back burner. That's how the meeting between Haig and Gromyko looked on the surface, but behind closed doors what went on that day was far different. The meeting took place only 15 days after Russia concluded her momentous secret financial transaction, and it was symbolic that both Russia's financial coup and the haig gromyko meeting took place in the same city, Geneva. The meeting of Haig and Gromyko reflects a startling new turning point in international relations. To understand what happened, it is essential to realize that the struggle for world power today is more complex than it appears on the surface. Daily news reports make it appear that it is basically a struggle between two antagonists, the United States and Russia. Everyone else gets classified as an American ally or as a Russian satellite or as part of the non-aligned Third World, so-called. That concept is simple and easy for just about everyone to understand. It's the old us versus them idea. Unfortunately, it happens to be wrong. The fact is that today the struggle for world power is not two-sided, but three-sided. There are three great power factions at work in the world today, each one jostling and maneuvering against the other two. I have devoted many past reports to giving you details about these three power factions and their relationships to one another, but let me just remind you once again who they are. Power Faction No. 1 is the Rockefeller Cartel, which embraces big oil, big banking, and large chunks of big business. Until about three years ago, 
the Rockefeller Cartel reigns supreme here in the United States. American Government policies were Rockefeller policies, and American wars were Rockefeller wars. Power Faction No. 2 is the International Bolshevik and Zionist Axis. As I detailed in AUDIO LETTERS No. 49 and 50, Bolshevism and Zionism are closely related and owe their existence partly to Rockefeller help long ago. After Bolshevism was imposed on Russia in 1917, a secret alliance was forged between the Bolsheviks in Russia and the Rockefeller Cartel here. For six decades these two factions orchestrated the actions of the Soviet Union and the United States for mutual benefit. By pretending to be enemies they established a giant pincers movement that was gobbling up the world. But Pyre Faction No. 3 has completely changed that picture during the past few years. This third faction is the tightly knit band of native Russians who have overthrown the Bolsheviks at the top in Russia. Russia's new rulers are a tough sect of Christians who are working from the top down to gradually weed out all the Bolsheviks in Russia. It's a Herculean task, but they are more patient than we in the West. They worked for six decades to seize control of the Kremlin, and they know better than to become hasty or impatient now. During recent years the new Kremlin has been expelling the hated Bolsheviks from Russia. Here in America the Rockefellers made the fatal mistake of welcoming the Bolsheviks from Russia. The Bolsheviks can never share power with anyone, and some three years ago they launched a coup d'etat against the Rockefellers. The coup began with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller, which was quickly disguised and covered up. Then Russian intelligence intervened here in Washington to prevent the Bolsheviks from achieving total success. Since that time there have been these three factions struggling for power. Here in America the Rockefeller Cartel is fighting a guerrilla war against the Bolsheviks for control over our country. The Bolsheviks, with their Zionist partners in Israel, are feverishly trying to get America into a nuclear war against Russia, and in Russia the secret new rulers are continuing to root out Bolshevism, and as they do so Christianity is beginning to revive in Russia. It's a long process but it's happening. At the same time the Kremlin is preparing for what they regard as the inevitable war even as they try to prevent it. So these are the three power factions now at work. Here in America the Bolsheviks, transplanted here after their expulsion from Russia, bent on war against Russia. Also here in America the Rockefeller Cartel who no longer want war for the reasons I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 67. They are preoccupied with regaining control over America. And the third faction, Russia's new rulers, do not want war for moral reasons. My friends, the meeting of Haig and Gromyko this week was actually a tough bargaining session between the Russians and the Rockefeller faction here. For entirely different reasons they presently find themselves with some interests in common. Both are now deadly enemies of the Bolsheviks here, the Rockefellers on a domestic basis, the Russians on an international basis, and for totally different reasons both the Rockefeller Cartel and the Russians want to prevent the war which the Bolsheviks are trying to set off. During recent months secret meetings have taken place between the representatives of the Rockefeller Cartel and Russia's ruling group. Those meetings led up to the Hegromiko meeting this week. My friends, a quid pro quo is now in the works between the Russians and the Rockefeller Cartel. It will be aimed at their mutual enemy, the Bolsheviks. Meanwhile the Bolsheviks here are continuing to line up support for the big war they intend to ignite soon. At the same time the Russians are equally busy trying to dissuade other countries from getting involved. These cross currents are producing some surprising lineups for war. Here is how it stands as of now, but keep in mind that further changes are bound to happen. On the side of the United States, 
Red China is the Bolsheviks' greatest prize up to now. Due to sheer numbers, Red China can tie down 50 Russian divisions. Chinese geography is also crucial, especially Sinkan Province, for American bases to attack Russia. Other major allies as of now are Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. New Zealand, by the way, is far more important than one might expect. The Bolsheviks here are also lining up the North Countries, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Of these, Norway is both the most important and most deeply committed to the war plan. The United States can also count on certain Latin American countries, and now also English-speaking Canada. This last represents a major change over the past three years. On Russia's side, the Warsaw Pact is still solid except Poland. Vietnam and North Korea also remain under Russia's control, as does Cuba. In addition, Russia can expect crucial help from India, Mexico, and French-speaking Quebec Province, Canada. Where Russia has made the most dramatic progress is in convincing nominal allies of the United States to turn neutral at the secret level. Countries in this category include Japan, France, Spain, the Netherlands, and even Belgium, where NATO headquarters is located. But the biggest target of all in this neutral category is West Germany. The Russians are holding out a firm promise to bond if the West Germans will simply set out any war to come. The promise, my friends, is the reunification of Germany. That promise was the secret reason behind the recent historic meeting of the leaders of the two Germanys, Schmidt and Honecker. Yes, my friends, the alliances are shifting as we draw closer to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. Some of these alliances are beginning to work against the Bolsheviks here, but as the Bolsheviks see the tide beginning to turn against them, they are only redoubling their frenzy for war. As a result, this new year of 1982 will be dangerous, and it may well also be decisive for the future of the world. Now it is time for my last-minute summary. As you know, last month in AUDIO LETTER No. 70 I offered to make a major change in the format of my Intelligence Report program. The revised arrangement would have involved less frequent tape reports with a new printed newsletter every two weeks. Since my only purpose in making such a change would be to serve you better, I ask for your reactions to the plan. Based on the response to AUDIO LETTER No. 70, my friends, my decision is not to proceed with the new printed newsletter idea. Instead, what I do plan to do is to resume making a tape every month as I did before my heart attack two years ago. I want to thank all of you who responded with your reactions as I requested last month. I know a few of you will be disappointed with the way it turned out, but I will do my very best to serve you even better than in the past. After all, serving you is what the AUDIO LETTER is all about. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.